Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so we'll do some brief introductions first, but I'll just go ahead and introduce myself and a little bit about the project and why we're here today. Uh, my name is Zach Grant. I'm the local food system small farm educator for the University of Illinois Extension here in Cook County. And this workshop is sort of hopefully the beginning of a longer term relationship between um, our land grant university down on campus, University of Illinois Champaign, Extension, other partner organizations like Loyola, and growers like you out in the field. So Extension's actual main role is really to facilitate the knowledge transfer from campus-based research to people out in the field who need it. And particularly in the area of aquaponics and hydroponics, around water quality, food safety, and a whole host of other issues, there has not been a lot of work or research or basic science or applied research done in this field. So um, with that in mind, uh, I developed a connection with Dr. Ellen Nguyen's lab down on campus, and we'll do a, a quick introduction of all the presenters really quick. And then very briefly, uh, for the rest of the participants, if you want to just want to introduce yourself briefly and tell us a little bit about why you're here, and then we'll go, go ahead and get started. So we do have a, a general agenda that we're going to try to stick to for the day. I'm going to move quickly through my portion as an introduction to just general food safety and what uh, hydroponic aquaponic growers need to know about FSMA, um, and, and we'll get into that in a second. So that's my introduction. We'll go ahead and start with Kevin. Hello everyone, I'm Kevin Erickson. I work here at Loyola. Um, my job title is the Urban Agriculture Coordinator, so I oversee an urban ag program for students, mostly undergraduate students, uh, and then I assist with a lot of other uh, classes. We have a farmer's market on campus, uh, and so uh, We'll be giving a brief tour at the end of this uh, of our facility. Hi, I'm Helen uh, Nguyen, and I'm from the Faculty of Environmental Engineering at the University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign. Um, so we currently are having two USDA funded projects related to uh, aquaponics and hydroponics. So I have a number of people from my lab here. Uh, we are presenting our finding, and more importantly, we would like to hear your feedback. So what do you really need um, us to find out in the lab? Great. Um, my name is Rivi, I'm from University Hospital. I want to learn more about uh, how to grow in aquaponics. Excellent. Okay. Uh, I'm Eric Weber, uh, I'm from uh, Plant Chicago. Uh, we're a nonprofit focusing on uh, local circular economies, uh, and we're going to go right into that. Uh, I'm Sully Stewart, work for Harvest 2.0. I'm uh, just here to learn a little more about what you guys have to tell. My name is Ken Davis. I'm the head grower for uh, BFF, indoor hydroponic farm, also at the plant with Eric. I'm uh, Andy McGee, and I'm going to say Harvest uh, Chicago Botanic Garden. Beth Brown, I'm a professor at Truman College and have been interested in aquaponics and hydroponics for a long time. And this is especially timely because as a senior um, biology tutor in our new science center, we are setting up like a mini aquaponics, hydroponics system literally right now. And it's very minute, but it, we're, the, half of the infrastructure is there um, in conjunction with our environmental club. So this is perfect timing to learn more about it, um, especially on a practical level, so we can integrate it into our one environmental class, but hopefully into some community programs, too. My name is Diane Pleble. I'm with the University of Illinois Plant Clinic, so I'm part of Extension. Oh, I'm Brennan Mori. I'm a PhD student at UIUC in the Pathobiology Department, and I'm working on a couple projects with Helen. My name is Nidal Masaka. I'm a postdoc with Dr. Helen. I'm working on um, post-water treatment technologies and uh, uh, disinfection processes and cytotoxicity of uh, wastewater. Hi, my name is Sean Quinn. Uh, I'm a postdoc with uh, Helen. Uh, so I work on uh, disinfection uh, of water and wastewater. Hi everyone, my name is Mimi. I'm a PhD student in Dr. Helen's research group. I'm working on viruses, disinfection of viruses attached to vegetables. I'm Gwen Godwin. I'm the lead grower at Garfield Produce Company. We are a hydroponic farm. Desert Parking. I'm a to be farmer. I've uh, taken up a 
aquaponic class with undirect feed and the density harvest and also some other things and uh, just acquired a land and going through the site planning. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for being here, and I, I want to thank Kevin and Loyola for hosting us graciously. I also saw Benjamin Camp from Metropolitan Farms, which is a, a medium-sized aquaponic facility, is here as well. So he'll be coming in briefly, but we'll kind of skip his introduction. You want to uh, introduce yourself just really quickly before we get started? Good morning. My name is Kamar Burroughs. Okay. Nice to meet you. Um, and in terms of uh, Helen mentioning feedback, uh, so this can be both in the form of informal feedback that we have, um, sort of sort of key informant interviews that we can do at the end of the session. But we'll also send you guys an email evaluation, so a Qualtrics online evaluation, to try to pull out some more questions that you may have at the end of this session that might drive future research on campus and, and maybe here at some of our partner organizations as well. So. I, I introduce myself as Zach Grant. I, I do a lot with uh, urban egg. I'm actually more of a soil-based systems person, but I know enough about soilless systems to be dangerous. Um, one of my other roles at the statewide level is actually produce safety training. Um, so I know some of you, I know Kevin and Gwen. Uh, Andy, you have a credit coming, and there's a couple other people here. How many uh, people have taken the Food Safety Modernization Act certified training? Okay, so only two of you, actually. So. We're going to be offering a few more of these trainings uh, in the fall. So we just did one with Windy, in the Alliance with Windy City Harvest in the middle of March. And we're going to dive into a little bit about the basics behind that for those of you who, who haven't gotten sort of a briefing on what FISMA is. But we're going to specifically talk about how it relates to hydroponic and aquaponic growers. Because there's a, a lot of questions that come up in these trainings. And in the last training we did with Windy City Harvest, a number of questions came up about how this applies to hydroponic and aquaponics, and we're going to spend a little time on that, as well as just a brief overview of, of the, the new food safety food regulations as well, okay? So, for those of you who aren't familiar with FISMA, who haven't gone through the training, again, we're not going to reiterate the entire training, um, but if you do want to take the training, uh, when we offer some in the fall, we will uh, we can get you on our mailing list and, and let you know about it. So what FISMA really is, for those of you who don't know, it's actually what we primarily do with the Produce Safety Alliance and the Produce Safety Training is just focus on one of seven rules, okay? So for the produce farmers, particularly, you know, larger scale farmers and even for controlled environment growers like yourself, this is the first time that you would ever have to encounter or deal with federal regulation at this level. Every single one of these other rules, the PC rule for human, animal, foreign supplier verification programs, all of that has existed for some, in some form or another for decades. So people in the value-added world and food processing world, this is just sort of an amendment to already existing rules. But for farmers on, on farm, actual production operations, this is the first time that the federal government has set guidelines that they want you to follow that could, where you could actually be audited or inspected by an FDA inspector or a, a U.S. Department or a State Department of Agriculture inspector, depending on on how your state handles that. In our state in Illinois, um, unfortunately, it's it's not yet established how that relationship will work. Odds are, it will end up being the FDA who will come in and inspect. So we'll probably have federal inspectors who will come in if there's some to be some enforcement with the produce safety rule. Other states have relegated that responsibility to their State Department of Agriculture in, in cooperative partnerships with that. So primarily what we're going to be focused on is just the produce safety rule. There are a number of flow charts and diagrams out there that you can follow to see if your operation overlaps with the preventative controls rule for human, human food. So if you're venturing into value added, then you may want to see if, you're, if what your operation is doing, if you um, can be classified as a farm with secondary farming activities, and not have to register as a facility with uh, the FDA. So, if, but if you do fall squarely with the full rule of pre preventive controls for human food rule, you would have to register as a facility. And there's a whole other set of requirements related to that. So, one one's called HARPC, which is a modified PASIC plan essentially. But we're, we're, what what we do in that training, and what we would do in the fall, for those of you who'd want to participate, or for those of you who are familiar who have taken the produce safety training know that we only cover uh, as this is related to produce safety specifically. So in all of this really just as sort of an overarching caveat to all this is that FISMA is really focused on prevention and not sort of creating sterile growing environments, both in a, in a soil based system or even a soilless system, controlled environment conditions uh, like this audience today. 
So we're going to just kind of briefly go over a few exemptions and kind of run through if, if you and your operation might fall within the FISMA guidelines. And then we're going to dive a little bit deeper into some of the comments that aren't explicitly in FISMA in the Port of Safety Rural Part of FISMA and wouldn't have been encompassed in the, in the training. But we're actually, uh, there is some guidance in the comment section uh, leading up to publishing the final rule for FISMA. But let's first start with the ex exemptions. So the qualified exemption is probably the, the rule that most people are familiar with and interested in finding if their operation is in alignment with. But there's actually a number of other uh, categories that can make your operation exempt from uh, FISMA and the Purdue Safety Rule itself. So the first thing to consider would be crop type. So of one of the rare prescriptive lists in the Food Safety Modernization Act, the Purdue Safety Rule specifically, is a list of different types of crops that are, are considered to be rarely eaten raw. And some of those actually do overlap with um, crops that are, some in some instances, also eaten fresh, but in this case, the FDA considers them to be really raw. Two examples of that would be like beets and sweet corn, which, you know, there's, we could argue, you know, for a while as to whether or not why, why those are categorized that way. The important thing to consider with this though, especially if you are a diversified operation and you're growing crops that are both covered and not covered, is are you really going to alter your management systems to, um, and your record keeping systems to reflect and, and, and sort of segment both of those different crops. Odds are most growers are just, if they are growing a, a crop that is uh, usually eaten raw, they're just gonna treat their rarely eaten raw commodities virtually the same way. But that is an important distinction, and that really only applies to, let's say, you know, large scale specialty crop growers who grow one commodity, let's say like potatoes or you know, sugar beets or something like that, and, and those operations would be exempt from FISMA. The next one is personal on-farm use or personal consumption. I remember when I first heard about F the whispers of FISMA in 2009, uh, 2010, there was, and this is before Facebook was, you know, the full momentum of what it is now. I was getting messages from people who, who knew I was into small farming and what I did. And they said, oh no, the, you know, the federal government is about to pass a law that's going to outlaw, outlaw your organic garden in your backyard. And, you know, there was a lot of hysteria surrounding it, but they, they made sure that they, they, they kind of put in this sort of exemption for that specific purpose. So if this is all for personal consumption or really likely if it's for donation as well, then you wouldn't, you would be exempt from the FISMA guidelines as well. Now we start getting in, into the sort of sales figures and sort of classification of different size businesses. So annual sales is a really important thing to know. And with this and the qualified exemption, it's important to know that even if you have the qualified exemption or you're exempt because of annual sales, you need to keep track of those records, okay? So if for some reason the FDA wanted to, wanted you to be able to prove that you had one of these exemptions, you have to have the records and the paperwork to prove that you have this uh, less than $25,000 in sale ex ex exemption. So in case, and with distribution with that $25,000 sale, there's no restriction on that. So this distribution distance exemption, this is where the qualified exemption comes into play because it mixes both the total amount of sales with uh, a, a classified end user and a distance. So what it says is that if you have total annual sale food sales, and this isn't just produce sales, so this would be any value added sales or any other food type sale, if you were saying, say you were selling like popcorn, right, that's rarely eaten raw as a process item, that would be lumped into this $500,000. So if you're at $500,000 in annual sales or less over a three year average adjusted for inflation and 51% or more of those sales are to what they call a qualified end user. So a qualified end user, and this is where the, what they call the tester exemption came in with FISMA. This, this is, these are end users like selling at a farmer's market, selling at a farm stand, selling through CSA shares. Um, selling to a restaurant, selling to a local grocery store, okay, then, then you would have an exemption to that. The final distance portion of this is the 275 mile radius. So this would be 275 miles uh, of radius surrounding the entire farm. Um, you will have to also add into that and you can have the qualified exemption. With that though, you also have to keep track of records and be able to prove that you're under a half million dollars in sales. And you would have to probably keep detailed invoicing record to prove the, the distribution measure as well. And there are some labeling requirements that you have to adhere to. 
And in the preamble for FISMA, you know, there's just this general preamble that says you will not sell adulterated or contaminated food into the food uh, stream. So even if you're exempt, you're not exempt from a couple things within FISMA and you're not exempt from the marketplace, as we'll see when we talk about the differences between FISMA and what GAP is. And the final thing we'll discover really briefly is commercial processing. So if you're selling one product that has a validated kill step process to an end user or to a commercial uh, processor, and you can have written assurances from the customer with the certificate of conformance for that validated kill step, then FIS you'd be exempt with FISMA as well. So the, the classic example for this wouldn't really apply uh, to controlled environment growers, but, so, but like if you were just growing paste tomatoes on a large scale and selling it to Heinz, turn it into ketchup, that would be an example of that, but at, at, a, at a very, very large scale. So even if you have one of these exemptions and you are exempt from FISMA, it's still a good idea to follow good agricultural practices or GAP guidelines. So these were ed just educational guidelines that were put in place as a collaboration between the USDA and FDA as far back as 1998. And this was a voluntary market-driven educational system for growers to adhere to. We'll talk about third-party GAP verification in a little bit. But even if you're exempt, you should still probably have taken some sort of GAP practice. And you know the Produce Safety Alliance training that I mentioned before is is essentially a, a gap training as well. It just merges FISMA in with it so you understand how it overlaps with FISMA itself. So even if you're exempt from it, you should still follow good agricultural practices and you wouldn't necessarily be exempt from the marketplace because you may have buyers who specifically require you to have other third party gap certification or they may even want you to sort of prove that you are in compliance with FISMA as well. Now, it's not may not be a requirement, but they may want to know um, and see a food safety plan or some sort of information and record keeping that shows you are in compliance with FISMA as well as maybe a third party verification audit. So if you are compliant, if you have to be compliant with FISMA or you think your operation is eventually going to get to the size where you will have to be compliant with FISMA, here are the general guidelines that you can follow. Okay, so we already mentioned the less than $25,000 in sales and qualified exemption, but if you're a very, very small business, the sales less than a quarter of a million dollars, you have until 2020 to become compliant with FISMA. With the water requirements, which we're going to talk a little bit about water, water will be a major theme today. The water testing, the microbial water quality profile specifically, you have an, you'll have an additional two years to come into compliance. And that I'm pretty sure that actually means that so that would be 2022 20, for very small businesses. You actually wouldn't have to start developing your water quality profile until 2022 legally. So that gives you quite a bit of time, flexibility to, you know, alter your systems or understand um, how you're going to go about getting your water quality profile established. Sam, then, could I, you say say that again? Just the, say that again. The microbial water quality profile. Yeah. Well, the the we're going to be we can start. Working on compliance, right? Time. As you'll see, you'll see the the, the the FDA supplemental slide here in a little bit. Oh, okay, that because this additional two years actually isn't law yet. Uh, they're 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 planning on implementing this, and my interpretation of it, as well as others at the Produce Safety Alliance, is that that means you won't have to start keeping records for your water quality profile until that day. It's a requirement, right? Will be but, Right. Well, it's already well. It's already been. I mean, if they didn't pass it, then 2022 would be when these very small businesses would have to begin keeping records of their water quality profile. But I would advise you as soon as possible to begin to find the right lab, understand the right test that you need to do, and and start developing that now rather than waiting. So, and as you move up to the larger businesses, all the way up to what they consider very large businesses. Um, Compliance began at the end of January of this year, but even those growers will have an, probably an additional two um, years to comply with that. And actually, this is an older slide. I think I think it's actually an additional four years now. We'll get to that slide very briefly in a second. But this just kind of gives you a timeline for when, if FISMA complies through your operation, applies through your operation, when you'll have to actually come into compliance with FISMA. Okay, so here we go. Here is here is that supplemental slide and with the proposed uh, water-related compliance date. So I believe, right, for the very small, for the large businesses, it was going to be 2020. Now they gave them additional two years, so it'll be 2022. And for the very, very small businesses, they'll have until 2024 to begin to develop their water quality profile. But 
even if you fall in that category, it's, it'd be advisable to begin to sort of track those numbers and understand your water quality um, now. So we're not going to go into this, and this is really the meat of what the training represents when you actually take the, the FDA-recognized curriculum that some of you have taken and some of you may want to take with us in the fall. We essentially cover all possible routes of contamination, or at least what the FDA see, sees as, and what the traditional GAP training sees as the main routes for potential microbial contamination. And the Purdue Safety um, Training really focuses on microbial contamination. It recognizes physical and chemical risks as well, but it really just focuses on the microbial contamination as it relates to these different routes. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit more about agricultural water in a minute. And obviously the thing in here that most of you are thinking is, well, so, you know, controlled environment situations, soilless systems are completely different than soil-based systems, so a lot of this doesn't apply. And we're gonna get to the FDA's comments about that in a second. <laughs> But essentially what they're saying is that, yes, it still does apply. And pretty much every single one of these would, could still apply to a controlled environment situation with the flexible exception of number four, right? Because the media that most hydroponic and aquaponic growers are, are growing in is somewhat of an inert media. Um, but you do have to consider other amendments and inputs as well, where that may present you know, more chemical and physical risks, but I mean, I guess fish feed for an aquaponic situation might be the one example where a biological input could still be a route for contamination from an input. So we'll cover that in a second. And we're also going to cover, uh, look at the differences between GAP and talk about GAP very, very briefly. The other thing I wanted to note on this slide is that sprouts, how many of us in here are, are growing sprouts? Good. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, so sprouts are recognized, as, as many of us are probably aware um, by the FDA as a very high risk crop. So sprouts actually has its own separate subsection under the produce safety rule. And with that, its own separate training. So the produce safety alliance training that we do does not include sprouts. The Illinois Institute of Technology and IFISH actually is the alliance for sprouts and they have a whole separate all day training that relates specifically to sprouts. Another important distinction, which we'll cover in another slide, is that the FDA recognizes in subpart M of the produce safety rule that microgreens are not sprouts. That was an important distinction that they put in place, and our neighbors to the north in Canada, their equivalency of the FDA does not make that distinction. And they consider microgreens and sprouts to be the same thing and hold them to that higher level of, of, of sanitation standard as what's covered under subpart M in FSMA. Okay, so that's an important distinction to make. How many of us are growing microgreens or some form of microgreens? Okay, so a few more, and there is an important distinction. If you want to read more about that distinction, you can uh, find that information at, at, on iFish's website, I believe, or just type in the Sprout uh, Safety Alliance. You can find that alliance and find a lot of information about sprouts and the difference between sprouts and microgreens. Okay. So now we're going to get into the bulk of the reason why you are here and the, your questions about how FSMA actually relates to aquaponic and hydroponic operations. Because there was a lot of confusion about this, and I, I still think that there is. But, and you know, for those of you who have taken the training, and I know Ben, Eric, and Gwen, and a few other people have taken the training, um, there is nothing in that training that specifically talks about aquaponics and hydroponics. But if you read the full text of FSMA, they actually have a preamble and a separate 300 page comment section that they use before they actually publish the final rule. And within the comment section, there actually are a number of comments about aquaponic and hydroponic operations and the FDA's um, response to those comments. So even though it's not explicitly in FSMA, I think implicitly um, it is. And, and I think the reason why it's not there is because they do recognize that the growing environments are different. However, neither of those, these types of operations are exempt from the produce, or the produce safety rule part of FSMA, okay? Because most of those other routes of contamination, other than potentially some of the soil amendments, um, these operations still have those potential routes of contamination. So the reason why there is an implicit recognition in the actual training or discussion of it is because they consider these operations to be covered just the same way that soil-based operations are covered, okay? 
So that's just in general what, what I would say the FDA sort of stands on these operations and, and how they relate to FSMA. What they do talk about is a little is, is a lot more about sort of physical separation, right, between water and the, the produce that might come into contact with that water. So there's a lot of discussion about that. The agricultural water portion of this training, for those of you who have taken it, as you know, is the most dense and difficult to understand part of the training. But it's the most important because water is kind of the, the sort of great spreader of contamination potentially. Okay. So if the water does not come into contact with the harvestable portion of the produce, then the water is not considered agricultural water, as defined by FISMA and the FDA. So if it doesn't come into contact, then the water uh, does not actually have to adhere to the uh, water quality requirements in subpart E of the produce safety rule. Okay, And this is mainly, there's a distinction between the water that's used for irrigation, right, during the growing of a crop, and the water that might be used during harvest or after harvest or post harvest water. There's two different water quality standards in FSMA. But if you can create that separation between the water, whether it's a hydroponic system or an aquaponic system between the water and the harvestable portion of the crop, then the FDA would not recognize that as egg water and therefore it wouldn't have to meet that standard for things like irrigation water. Okay, but if there is a risk that it's gonna come in contact, then you should still probably have some level of a water quality profile established just so you can prove that it's, it's at or below that standard, okay? Um, and we're gonna talk about the post-harvest standard in, in a second. So they also recognize in the comment section that yes, fish are not normal shedders of E. coli specifically. However, if present under high enough counts, they do recognize that they can become carriers and could become one of the potential routes for contamination um, in other things like feed, water, or sediment that might be accumulated in an aquaponic system specifically. And they also sort of made mention in some of the responses about some other species like Vibrio, which can cause gastrointestinal infections in humans, that fish are carriers of, of those, right? And that those might also present um, a risk for contamination or foodborne illness outbreak. So considering all that is the reason why they consider these operations to have to become uh, compliant with FSMA if you, you know, don't have one of the conditional or qualified exemptions we mentioned before. So in terms of the subpart M, which we just discovered, discussed, that's the separation between sprouts and microgreens, which is an important distinction for a lot of growers. They recognize the difference, which is important. And it's, it's still important to understand that sprouts have the more, much more strict standard than, than all other products that might be grown, so all other covered produce items. However, even though it's not required, they do encourage hydroponic and aquaponic growers to follow the stricter standards of subpart M. So if you want to really understand subpart M, I, I recommend you take the Sprout Alliance safety training. But just in general, two of the main things that differentiated it from the, rep, the normal produce safety rule are two things. One is the testing of spent irrigation water, okay, in the system, within system, for E. coli and salmonella. Whereas with the, the rest of the rule, you only have to test for generic E. coli in irrigation water, okay? You don't have to test it at the end of a system, like say, let's say in like a drip, drip tape system in a bed out in the field. You don't have to do uh, end, end source testing. You, you actually typically are testing it from its source and you're just testing for generic E. coli. But in sprout operations, they want you to probably have that standard test. They want that standard as well, but they also want you to test your spent irrigation water as well for both of those things. The other important distinction is environmental swab testing, which is a standard test for, the, for most uh, processing facilities to do environmental swab testing for listeria specifically. So they have sort of two more stringent, both environmental and water testing standards that are above and beyond what the normal produce safety rule covers. So operations are not required to do that, but they are encouraging operations to do that. So it would be interesting to look at the economics of, of what this would cost on top of the microbial water profile standard that you're doing for the rest of your irrigation water. So let's briefly talk about gap certification for, oh, question in the back. I feel like I probably should know the answer to this, but 
there's a distinction between how microgreens and sprouts are treated, mm -hmm. made by some in some cases, because there are pathogens that are more likely to grow with sprouts and not likely to grow with microgreens? It's, no, it's because of the environmental conditions that they're grown in okay. and how they're harvested. Because okay. sprouts are typically harvested with seed coat intact and the radical, okay. the root yeah. system yeah. intact, and you're consuming the whole thing. Whereas microgreens, you typically aren't harvesting the seed coat, which is a source of contamination for Salmonella and E. coli, and you're harvesting above the, the root line, so to speak. So those two things are what make sprout production and consumption a little bit more risky. So the microgreens might have the pathogens, but you're not harvesting the part of them that... Potentially. Potentially. But the other thing that I didn't uh, sort of discuss here is that seed lot testing is actually, I, I don't know if it's a requirement in subpart M, but typically sprout producers have seed lot testing verification from their seed sources, yeah. whereas that's not typically done by microgreen growers. So, but it's a little confusing too. I mean, an example would be of a vendor like Johnny Selected Seeds, let's say for instance, you look in their catalog, they sell bulk amounts for microgreen production, but they also have separate sections for sprouting seeds, which they carefully lot test those specific varieties for Salmonella and E. coli. Where, and so there might be some overlap between their bulk microgreen and their sprout seeds, but, but some things you would grow for microgreens aren't specifically lot tested for E. coli and Salmonella. But you could do that yourself too, in theory. That could be another test that you do. So okay. tracking seed lot numbers and and that potentially being the source of contamination. Um, I don't know if that's specifically part of subpart M. It may be. And actually, seed treatment is another part in subpart M that's different than um, the rest of FISMA as well. So one of the questions that was brought up early on, because we actually, when I was before I came on with Extension, I was down on campus managing a small farm operation for the university. And we actually went through one of USDA's certified third-party verification programs, which is voluntary. We'll get to that in one second. But there was this question early on as to whether aquaponic and hydroponic operations could also participate in those programs that were traditionally for soil-based systems. I still have yet to find, uh, well, at least within the USDA's auditing system, sort of information about that. However, in doing some research, I came across a memo from 2014 that indicates that the USDA AMS third-party gap verification program, they will certify aquaponic and hydroponic operations on a case-by-case -case basis. And it's interesting to read through this memo and they actually kind of list out a few SOPs and other things that they may actually require or for farms that they, aquaponic operations they have certified, the things that they saw in those operations that they liked that would, you know, would work well for an operation if, the, if you wanted to get it certified on a case-by-case -case basis, okay? So one of the things was a flow chart showing water flow within the system, okay? So having a detailed description of where the water moves, how it moves, and the different areas that it moves into. And then again, this separation between fish and crop was, was prominent. And this was in the response section for the comments about FISMA as well, because having a physical barrier separation between the aquaculture side and the actual hydroponic side of the operation uh, in an aquaponic system, okay? They recommend filtration and treatment of water before entering plant area. So, they, and they, they said that they've certified multiple operations with a number of different sanitation methods, including what you see here, okay? And we're gonna, and, and Helen's group is gonna discuss a couple of these when we get to that portion of it. The other important part about this is that they also wanted you to be able to prove within your food safety plan to the auditor that your water treatment system is actually working. So you have to show probably before and after water <coughs> testing uh, requirements to show that, that it actually is working, okay? And then just a number of other SOPs like hand washing between you know, fish handling and plant work, uh, you know, equipment separation like aprons, fish area versus plant area, implementing a drop produce rule, which is actually a requirement for soil-based systems. So that would be, you know, if you're harvesting out in a field and you're, you know, there's separation between crops in their harvesting bins and the soil, but if you drop some produce into the <coughs> soil, that you would just, you would not put that into distribution. You would separate that out as a drop produce rule. They want that same rule in an aquaponic operation as well. So if that, if a head lettuce hits your, you know, deep water culture tank, 
that you compost that. You don't introduce that into the, the stream. And then they also want frequent water testing. So we're going to look at the differences between uh, GAP, third-party GAP certification water testing requirements and FISMA in a second. But it's interesting that they mention frequent water testing, which they didn't give an exact amount. Um, but you'll see in a second here how it might be closer to uh, the surface water standard rather than like the well water or the um, municipal water standard in a second. So really briefly, we'll just fly through this section so we can uh, get to the next portion. Um, there is some confusion about the difference between what GAP and FISMA is, and I just wanted to clarify this really quickly. FISMA now is law. So this is federally mandated regulation where the FDA can actually come in and inspect your farm as a matter of law. GAP and third-party groups have what they call voluntary independent third-party audit programs. So the best analogy I can think of would be organic certification, right? Organic certification is not a requirement, right? It's a voluntary program that you participate in, you know, for because of, you know, principles or because of you want to get into a different market. It's the same thing with third-party GAP. And there's a number of different groups that do it from private third-party Groups like Primus, SQF, I mentioned USDA, AMS, they also do this third-party audit as well. So completely separate things. One is voluntary and market-driven, the other is federally mandated. And most of their sort of requirements do merge with some distinctive differences. And the thought is, is that, you know, as FISMA becomes more readily accepted, that, you know, the standards for both will probably merge. So if you're doing you know, record keeping for one, it would probably more than likely cover you for a third party uh, program if you wanted to participate in that. But it's just totally voluntary. So all of the, you know, the different guidelines, they, they overlap significantly. One of the things that's interesting that isn't required by FISMA is a traceability and mock recall program. Although it seems like, <laughs> And, and, and food safety and a food safety a required food safety plan. That's a requirement for third party audits. It's not necessarily an implicit requirement for FISMA. However, we have learned um, through some of these on farm readiness programs that FDA auditors will want you to have some form of a food safety plan for them to see your records and see the sort of flow of your operation. So even though it's not required, one it's required in one and not in the other, it's a good idea to have them for both, and, and that would apply to a traceback program as well. So, but there is a most most overlap. Um, the difference is is in the water testing standard. In at least in the in the USDA AMS program, they actually only required for all types of water sources, whether it's surface, groundwater, or municipal water, they only do one test a year. That was the minimum requirement that they actually have with FISMA. They actually break it into um, the risk with with the, the potential source. So if you're using surface water, which would include uh, rainwater catchment, you would have to have this baseline of 20 samples that you establish over two to four years with a five year um, five sample yearly that you roll into a rolling average for your water quality profile. With groundwater, it's less stringent, and with public water uh, in GAP, they still actually wanted you to test it once a year. But with FISMA, you actually only have to uh, show a test, a certificate of conformance essentially from the municipal water supplier that you're getting the water from. So they're testing it, they're monitoring. If you can just get their certificate and have that on file, that's all you need for FISMA. But it's probably still a good idea to test that water anyway to understand some other water quality things that are going on as well. So we talked about the ag water definition a little bit and how you know, if the water isn't, at least for irrigation purposes, isn't coming into contact with the produce or the food contact services, that you could you could get away with not adhering to the FISMA water quality standard. But if there is a risk, right, then you probably should still develop that water quality profile anyway. So here is, I, I mentioned the post-harvest water, so water during harvest and everything after harvest. So this would include hand washing, cleaning, sanitizing food contact services, any water we're using for washing or cleaning produce, and all sprout water, most stringent standard, which is actually zero detectable generic E. coli. For irrigation water, the standard is up to 126 colony forming units per 100 mils of water is the standard, with a statistical threshold variation of, I think, 410 colony forming units. So, which we're not going to go into, that's actually a very detailed part of the training, but 
you know, if you come take the training in the fall, you'll understand that a little bit better about what that means. But for all post harvest water, the zero detectable generic E. coli is the standard. And there are ways that you can reduce that. And Helen's group is going to talk about a few different ways. They're mainly going to focus on chlorine and aqueous ozone treatments. But there are other options like UV treatment. Uh, and parasitic acid treatment. So this is actually, this is a, sort of a non-replicated study that was done by Hawaii Extension where they went through this process of taking known contaminated water with a certain level of E. coli as incoming water and applying a number of different uh, treatment treatments. And they actually ran all of these through filters first, whether it was an inline sand filter or inline disc filters that had a certain micron size. Uh, and, and apply these different treatments. And, and you actually have this supplemental handout. I just wanted to show this to you because there is a lot of flexibility in FSMA in, in a lot of different areas. One of them is actually how you actually do the water testing to establish your water quality profile. But if you are going to apply a treatment to your irrigation water or your post harvest water, they give some, there are some recommendations we talk about in the training, and we'll discuss that in the research today. But there is flexibility that if you have a provable treatment system in play and you have the data and information resources to back that up, you can use that treatment. Okay, so they allow for flexibility. Same thing with the water testing standards. So the initial initial testings, and this is that's why I wanted to show you this because if you develop the process where you had your incoming water, you knew the initial water quality and you applied your version of the treatment, you had the data and the information to back it up to prove that it was getting below the standard for irrigation water or, or zero not detectable uh, for the post harvest water, you could use that methodology, okay? So part of this research initiation is to start to explore uh, some of those treatment methodologies. But for the water testing standard, this is something where they just initially kind of came out with this information because <coughs> The initial method that they recognized was this method called EPA 1603 membrane filtration with modified MTEC. This was a really hard standard to adhere to because this is something where you had to have access to a lab that used this method and the process had to be, um, the sample had to be processed within six hours. And there's virtually, in, in depend, especially if you're in a rural area, there's no lab that can do that around, around you. So they've subsequently released a number of what they call equivalent water method testing methodologies. And whatever lab you end up using, or if you have access to your lab and you wanted to do this yourself, they list a number of these different methods. So there's these membrane, other membrane fil filtration methods like MTEC agar disks and these MPM methods like the Collier standard. So someone did ask the question uh, in the registration about if there were water testing methodologies that one could do themselves rather than sending off to the lab. And in reading in the comment section for FISMA, the FDA actually did recognize that, but they haven't released any guidance as to a standard water quality test for quantitative measures of generic E. coli, not qualitative, either present, not present. And the thing about some of these methods, I did a little research, like to get an agar plate for MTEC agar, I mean, these things are only like three or four bucks a piece. And same thing for these collier trays, these are only a dollar a piece. It, depending on which one you get, but the equipment that you need to seal them and analyze them is thousands of dollars. So unless you had a lab in place um, that you probably would actually eventually have to certify, you know, odds are you're probably just going to be sending these samples in to a certified lab anyway, okay? Because that is just going to be more convenient for you. So there are some different options. And yes, they may have extended the deadlines, but I think it's important to establish your water quality profile starting now. Um, if you haven't already been doing that, okay? So I think that's all I have as an introduction. And at the end of my uh, PowerPoint, I actually have uh, my email and contact information. So if you want to get a hold of me or you want to learn more about uh, when we're going to be doing another FDA-recognized FISMA Produce Safety Rule training, you can get a hold of me as well, okay? So let's go ahead and bring up, uh, We're gonna next we're going to bring up uh, Helen Nguyen's research group. And so... Uh, we have a various people from campus who are going to come up and present some of the, the, the work that they're doing down there on campus. Um, we do have lunch coming. And depending on the time frame, we may actually turn it into a working lunch. So we can kind of get done by our 2 p.m. deadline, give Kevin some time to introduce what he's doing here, and allow us to tour their facilities as well. Okay? So why don't we bring the first uh, member of Helen's group up and get their presentation queued up. And while we're doing that, if there's any questions that you have about what I presented in the introduction, we can um, 
answer those now. Yeah. Do you recommend any labs for uh, micro water testing? So what I can do is that we have a whole list of them. So rather than me saying use this lab, which I really shouldn't be doing, endorsing any particular lab, I can send that to you. Cool. So I have a, a PDF that I can send you that will list a number of different labs. Um, and the key thing is just to make sure that they're following best lab practices and they have some form of certification and they are following one of those tests that we outlined. Are there some based in Chicago? Uh, there are. There are some. There are some. And I know that Loyola, are you guys doing water testing as well? Do you know if you guys are following that standard for the lab that you're I don't think up? we're offering that test right now. Okay. But we may be offering it soon. Uh, we have a bunch of water quality tests that we offer that are online at our website, or I can show you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Any other quick questions before we bring on to ask, yeah. Do you anticipate that the sort of what was included in the comment section with Prisma will end up being turned into a more of a defined guidance? Kick, right. Guidance would be what it would be. Here's here's the clicker right here. Right. That's a really good question and it's unclear. If when, once you take the training and you learn about the Purdue Safety Alliance, it's important to sign up for their, their email list and follow their website for guidance developments like that because the that water testing data extension and things like that are coming out all the time. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if they do release specific guidance for controlled environment, hydroponic, aquaponic operations as well. But right now I haven't seen anything come down the pipeline. Everything that I showed you from there is just my interpretation of the comment section in the actual, you know, five thousand pages of, of the Prisma rule. So we'll see. Awesome. Okay, thank you guys. Um, our next presenter. Hello everyone. Again, I'm Mia Fuzawa. Today uh, I will be talking about how can we control food viral infection risk. So before I talk about this, I would like to appreciate this precious opportunity that I can actually interact with professional farmers. So, uh, so now I want to start my presentation. So this presentation is about viruses. So here is a comparison between bacteria and viruses. So earlier, Zach talked about bacteria, including E. coli, Salmonella, Listeria, Rat. But in my research, I focus on virus. So what is the difference between bacteria and virus? So bacteria, we don't have actually any face on this, but I have this here. <laughs> so, Bacteria includes Salmonella, E. coli, Listeria. Uh, they can make us sick if we take the uh, bacteria into our food. So they can reproduce, they can replicate uh, themselves without, uh, if there is nutrients. But for viruses, they need an uh, organism or cells called host organism or host cells. So they cannot increase by themselves in the environment. But this but virus is still important. Why? Because bacteria, like I talk about the example of Salmonella here. Uh, if Salmonella uh, wants to make us sick, uh, we need 100,000 Salmonella cells that we have to bring into our body. But for viruses, if we have a strong virus, uh, only 10 virus particles can make us sick. That's why uh, in our research, we focus on viruses. So this is the actual outbreaks associated with viruses. So this is a publication from Europe that we had outbreaks uh, from lepers in Denmark. Uh, this right figure shows uh, outbreaks of uh, viruses associated with tomatoes. So it is important to watch out uh, if we have contamination or not on fresh produce. So, as you know, fresh produce has higher infection risk compared to cooked food. Why is that? Because when we cook food, let's say we want to make stir fry, so we heat, heat up the vegetables. So even if we could have uh, pathogens, bacteria or viruses attached to the vegetables, by heating up the vegetables, we can kill um, the pathogens, like viruses, let's say. But when we have a salad vegetables or fresh produce eating raw, 
we are not gonna inactivate, we are not gonna kill the viruses. So we can take a live virus into our body. So that's why we have higher infection risk for fresh produce. So you may wonder how you get, uh, how we could get uh, viruses in uh, fresh produce. So we have uh, many sources of contamination. We could get uh, viruses by hand contamination or irrigation water, or maybe soil could have contamination with viruses. So when we have a contamination with hand water soil, these viruses can attach to fresh produce surface. So usually after uh, harvest, we, could, we, will, we will have a sanitation process. We will disinfect the vegetables. But if this sanitation process is not effective, we could still have risk of infection. So in my research, I focus on sanitation here, uh, and also how, mu mm, how much risk of infection I am getting by eating vegetables. So here is fresh produce disinfection. Uh, if this is massive scale, we usually dip uh, fresh produce into disinfectants like chlorine. But as I said, we still have outbreaks associated with lettuce, tomatoes, other kinds of fresh produce. So I was wondering how effective is this process to inactivate viruses. So for my research, I chose uh, one kind of virus called rotavirus. So I chose rotavirus. So rotavirus, what is rotavirus? Is that one of the major causes of diarrhea among the children under five years old? So we have uh, two rotavirus vaccines available uh, worldwide from since 2006. However, uh, still rotavirus is responsible for 215,000 children deaths per year worldwide. So here is the reason I chose rotavirus for my research. Rotavirus is one of the most frequently detected viruses in water environments. So this is one of the uh, examples here. We have a lot of detections of rotaviruses. So uh, people detected rotavirus in river water in Japan. A lot of kind of vegetables in Mexico, coriander, parsley, celery, uh, spinach, and lettuce. Also oysters in Mexico. Also rotavirus uh, were detected in strawberries in Canada. Sewage and surface water in Netherlands. So what I want to tell you here is that you can see many detections uh, in both in developed countries and developing countries because rotavirus is very common. So it is very difficult to eliminate uh, all the rotavirus contamination. So that's why I chose rotavirus. So here's the research question I wanted to answer in my research. I wanted to understand the disinfection efficacies of uh, rotavirus using two different sanitizers. So disinfectants for this study I chose is what is called a tsunami. Have you ever heard of this disinfectant? Lots of people know, thank you. So this tsunami is from a company called Ecola. So when you, this sanitizer is allowed for organic produce as well. This uh, is approved by EPA to use wash, to wash vegetables and fruits. So the advantage of tsunami is we don't have no toxic byproducts formation. Although we can form toxic products uh, by use of chlorine, when we use chlorine, we have to adjust the pH very well. But for this disinfectant, we don't need to adjust the pH. It's not corrosive. So here is the price. One, one thirty for four gallon. Although chlorine is a lot cheaper, twenty dollars for four gallon. But some people prefer to use tsunami. I had one more sanitizer. I want to call this surfactant sanitizer in my presentation. So this is a mixture of organic acid called malic acid. 
malic acid is an organic acid uh, extracted from apple surface. And also, I had a surfactant. Uh, let's say it's like soap. So FDA approved that uh, we can use many kinds of surfactants to wash vegetables and fruits. This is one of the surfactants we chose. So this is recently proposed by food scientists, but this is not in use yet. So here is my disinfection experiment flow, how I did this experiment. So I intentionally contaminated my vegetables with rotavirus. So this blue circle is rotavirus. And I let them dry so, so that rotavirus can attach to the vegetable surface. And I immerse the vegetables into cold disinfectant. So again, I had two kinds of sanitizer separately. I had a tsunami from Ecolab and surfactant based sanitizer. After that, um, I counted viruses, how many viruses were actually survived after this disinfection process. So my goal is I want to have less viruses survived on my vegetables because I don't want to cause any food upon uh, outbreaks. So here is my data. So this is messy thread, so I want to walk through. So I had two different sanitizers, again, tsunami and surfactant based sanitizer. So this y-axis, x-axis shows how many, how long I exposed the vegetable to disinfectant. So I exposed it from zero time, zero time to eight, eight minutes. This y-axis shows virus survival. How many viruses were actually survived after, after the disinfection process? So this, when we go up, that means higher virus survival. If you go down, that means lower virus survival rate. So what we want to have is lower virus survival rate because we want to kill viruses as many as we can. So let's take a look at this tsunami graph here. So when I had, I had three kinds of vegetables and diet and two kinds of kale. When I had a and dive, 10% of virus is survived. But when I had a kale, two kinds of kale, only 0.1% survived. So this shows that depending on the kind of vegetables, I have different effectiveness of disinfection, which means that I have to know what kind of cultivar I have. So this is surfactant-based sanitizer data. So you can see this red and dive, uh, blue kale, this black also kale, they, uh, their effectiveness of this infection are about the same from 0.1 to 1% survival rate. So after I got this data, I conducted risk assessment to connect the data with a uh, real life scenario, which means that I wanted to estimate the potential of chance Getting, uh, of getting sick by eating these vegetables. So if I consume vegetables, I could just get happy by taking the nutrients from vegetables. Or if I have still viruses remaining on the vegetable surface, I could get sick. So I conducted risk assessment and I wanted to know what parameters, what factors actually influence uh, contributing to the cause of risk. So I had uh, many factors that is affecting uh, the risk. So what was most important was rotavirus concentration in irrigation water. So Zach talked about how important it is to have good uh, water quality. So I, my model also agreed with that. And also, disinfection efficacy were very important. So this is my model scenario, how I did uh, this risk assessment. I started with irrigation water here. So I assume that this irrigation water, I used treated waste water containing rotavirus. Uh, this was used for irrigation water. So. Uh, viruses attached to the vegetable surface. 
I had two kinds of vegetables, kale and endive, same as my disinfection experiments. After harvest, I disinfected the vegetable with different two types of sanitizer, tsunami and surfactant-based sanitizer. And I assume that people consume these vegetables. So here is my data from risk assessment. Let's take a look together. So this x-axis shows the chance of getting sick by eating these vegetables. So if you go right, higher risk associated. If you go left, if you go right, yes. If you go left, we have a lower risk associated. So what we want to have is lower risk because we don't want to get sick <coughs> by eating these vegetables. So when we had endive and tsunami, we had a higher risk because of uh, inefficient sanitation. When we had kale and surfactant, endive and surfactant, we had less risk associated. So this data tells us that produce type and sanitizer type affected the risk of rotavirus illness. So I also conducted another scenario-based analysis. So what I did was, since we know that rotavirus <coughs> irrigation water is very important, I changed the I changed the source of irrigation water in my in my risk assessment. So at first I only had a treated waste water, but now I assume that I use surface water from river, let's say, and also untreated waste water. So in the United States, it is prohibited to use uh, untreated waste water for irrigation use. But I assume that my irrigation water is contaminated with raw sewage. So I, so everything else was the same. So I just changed the irrigation water quality. So this is my data. So again, uh, y x axis shows this. Uh, this way we have higher risk. If we go this way, we have lower risk. So this blue line shows surface water. Uh, green line shows treated waste water. That one shows untreated waste water. So as you can see, if we have uh, when we have higher uh, third, uh, rotavirus concentration in the irrigation water source, that higher the risk of infection by consuming these vegetables. So irrigation water source also affected the risk of rotavirus illness. So here is my take home message for this presentation. So knowing the concentration of rotavirus in different water source is important. So we should know uh, how much contamination we have in the or if we have contamination or not in the irrigation water source. And we, we need to ensure the disinfection efficacy for your type of produce and sanitizer because depending on the cultivar and sanitizer, the effectiveness of disinfection are different. So this is my acknowledgement. Thank you very much. Any questions? Before we transition over, what, did you were there any treatments that were done to, to show a combination of the cervicant base and tsunami? Where you used both of them in one? Was that one of the treatments? Or yes, yes, I used the, both of them together. Some of people, uh, this is very new sanitizer. Some of people did it with E. coli, and then they said uh, uh, E. coli for E. coli, it was almost completely in a, uh, effective to cure all the E. coli. Right. So that's why we wanted to try with viruses. Because it seems like the parasitic based chemistries are effective against bacteria, but they're not as effective with some produce type with viruses specifically. Yes, yes, that is a good point. I think uh, depending on the leaf uh, properties, uh, it will change the effectiveness of disinfection. When we have a surfactant based sanitizer, surfactant uh, soap can uh, reduce the surface retention. So it can 
the disinfectant can be spread out on the fresh produce very well. Yes. Did you, while doing your research, come across any uh, findings which propose the washing step as a vector for transmission of contamination? Sorry, could you say that again? The washing step itself from raw produce. Um, did you find any research or did you have any findings that showed that that washing step itself, if not properly maintained, can be a vector for rotavirus contamination? Ah, yes, that is a good question. Yes, it could be. Uh, I, all, I, I didn't specifically find about the rotavirus, but it could be a vector for, for example, norovirus or uh, hepatitis A virus. If it's not uh, effectively disinfected, it could, it could be a vector for um, risk um, of illness. But um, we have a lot of factors associated, like let's say if I don't eat the vegetables right away, virus also can have natural decay, virus also can die as we store. So these actual factors could be associated, but yes, uh, effective disinfection is very important. Can, can I say something? So for some viruses that are very resistant to COVID, for example, the like Coxsackie virus, that could be a problem. Yeah. A lot of virus, the like virus, norovirus, norovirus, they are susceptible to COVID. So if you have COVID in there, then, then that is not effective. The Coxsackie virus is the only I think the other important thing to think about here is they're discussing the wastewater route contamination, whereas viral neuro and hep A, it's the contamination and spreading sources often the workers themselves. So it's important to have that, you know, hand washing SOP and protocol in place, and you know, sort of surface san sanitation thing in place as well to sort of compound all those good SOPs. So, so what we look at is the like those river water contaminated with like uh, waste water. So the worst case scenario. And so we look at the worst case scenario. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. If the next member uh, from Helen's group wants to come up and. So, hello again, I'm Brenda Moy. Um, my growing area of expertise is fish and plant pathogens in aquaponics, hydroponics, and aquaculture systems. Uh, that being said, I am neither a veterinarian nor a microbiologist, so I can answer some of the questions you may have. Um, I'm, what I'm going to talk about today is I'll give you a general overview of aquaponics, and I'm going to show you some really fun pictures of infected fish, and then I'll talk about disease transmission, control, and prevention in aquaponics systems. I'm focusing on fish today because someone else is doing hydroponics, um, but a lot of these do apply to all three system types. So, just an overview of aquaponics. Aquaponics is the beautiful marriage of aquaculture and hydroponics. Um, usually, almost always, these are recirculating systems. So, you take the water from the fish tank, they produce waste, mainly ammonia, and then nitrifying bacteria in the system convert the ammonia to nitrate. So, when the water is pumped from the fish tank to the plant tank, the plants use that nitrate to grow, and through growing, they clean the water. So then you pump the cleaned hydroponic water back into the fish system and reuse it. And that is one of the many benefits of aquaponics is once you set up the system, uh, it actually has very low water use um, because all you have to do is then top it off uh, when there's evaporation or there's a lot of splashing. Um, it's also also doesn't require a lot of land usage, so it's really good in places that have have very limited space. Um, also, energy usage is lower, and 
food safety risks also tend to be lower in these systems. So a general system setup. The most basic aquaponics system you can have is a fish tank, a plant tank, and a sump pump to just move all the water. Um, that can only really work well and healthily for a very, very small system. As soon as you get um, even a moderate amount of fish, you at least need some sort of solid waste management, even if that's just a separate tank where the settle, settleable solids can just kind of fall out so you don't pump just all of this fish poop right into the hydroponic system because you have to be careful because this the waste can uh, clog the plant roots and cause dead zones. So just stop nutrient uh, uptake and that is not good. So you can also have separate biological filtration units where these nitrifying bacteria have a specific tank to live in. Um, that's a good idea if this is a very big uh, system with a, a lot more fish. Uh, otherwise, you can just have these bacteria in the hydroponics tank and it works just fine. You can also throw in an equalization tank because this nitrification process is acidic. So if enough of it is happening, you need to continually throw in some sort of basic chemical to balance it out because you want the pH to be around 7. So I just have a couple pictures of some different types of aquaponics system. This is a small deep water culture where the plants are grown and floating, usually styrofoam rafts in plastic pots. The roots just hang in the water and um, they uptake the nutrients that way. Uh, nutrient film technique is also a common one. Usually you just drill holes in PVC pipes. Uh, and then the same idea as the deep water culture. The roots grow in the pipes, water is pumped through the pipes, and they uptake the nutrients as the water flows. And then small media bed is also a common one. Uh, the plants, cut, this is the most similar to a soil system, where the plants will grow in either a gravel or a clay media and the water is also pumped through the system. They uptake the nutrients. So what can go wrong in these systems? Pathogens. Pathogens are everywhere. They're my favorite. So I just wanted to go over a couple of the common ones uh, that you would find for fish in these systems. All of these are potentially lethal at high enough doses, um, which is exciting. So columnaris disease is can be a big problem. It's, called, it's caused by a bacteria called Flavobacterium column, column there. Uh, this bacteria can also cause bacterial gill disease, if you've ever heard of that, or can cause major skin lesions. Um, it's not a fun thing to have in your system. I'm not even going to bother to try to pronounce this. Uh, it's commonly called ick, and it's a parasite uh, very hard to get rid of in your system. Actually, the parasite, that's not from the water, that's actually uh, the white dots are the parasite itself. There are several strains of herpes viruses that fish can get. Um, this particular one is in koi. Uh, again, lethal. This is a fungi that is common uh, for fish. Um, I just really liked that picture. <laughs> so moving on to the more useful part of this, just a quick overview of what biofilms are. Um, a biofilm is basically bacterial slime that grows on surfaces. Uh, bacteria colonize the surfaces and then they release um, sugars, uh, proteins, DNA to kind of give themselves this protective matrix to live and grow in uh, and this is great for them it protects them from a bunch of environmental stressors like heat uh, disinfectants um, it makes them resistant to water movement so it's hard to dislodge them uh, and it protects them if their nutrient uh, supply dwindles for a bit um, all of these reasons are great for the bacteria and awful for us because biofilms are everywhere and they can be very hard to deal with and as long as the conditions are right for bacterial growth, they will grow on any surface. So I brought this up 
because I have two uh, articles that I really like that I thought would be useful to share with you. The first one be, being a study that looked at the bacteria that causes columnaris disease. They looked at biofilm formation uh, that could potentially happen in aquaponics or aquaculture systems. So they broke this study into three parts. Uh, at first, they looked at just biofilm formation in a steady state, uh, no flow system. Very basic, they just put a glass micro microscope slide in a flask, well, they did multiple flasks, um, with this nutrient solution and the bacteria and just watched it grow. Um, and it colonized it very well in, a, in just the span of a few hours, um, showing that it can grow on glass, among other materials, including plastics and concrete. Uh, then they looked at bacterial attachment and growth in a flow system. Same thing, colonized in a matter of hours. Within 48 hours, a complete biofilm had formed. Um, and then lastly, they looked at, is the bacteria in these biofilms, can it still cause disease and mortality in these fish? And so what they did was they looked at channel catfish, which is one of the most common fish uh, farmed in these systems, and they uh, abraded their skin uh, to create light wounding, and then they took a sample of the biofilms, exposed the wounds on the catfish uh, to the bacteria, and then just watched what happened, and without, within 48 hours all the fish were dead of columnaris disease. And so I, w I wanted to emphasize that last bit of the study because it shows just the major problem that biofilms can have in a system because it's not like you get a biofilm, but it's all right, it's on the surface, it's not a problem. If you have a situation where the fish have wounds like this um, and you get the biofilm if pieces of biofilm detach, which they can, that is easy to do. They are flow resistant, but cells just get released. Uh, bam, you have disease in your system. So it's very important to try to prevent these bacteria in the first place, because if they start colonizing, it can be very hard to get them out of your system. The second article I wanted to talk about was they looked at um, another bacteria called uh, Aramonas hydrophila, which is very, very common uh, in the environment and aquaponics, aquaculture systems. Um, they wanted to see how different uh, handling methods and environmental conditions affected fish susceptibility to um, what are the diseases this bacteria can cause. And they looked at several different uh, situations, uh, the first being how the fish were handled during transport and the presence of wounds. And they found that when fish uh, were transported rougher, so like say, so you're moving them from the truck to the tanks, if you take six of them at a time together in your net, and you're just jumping them back and forth, um, they are more likely there's higher mortality among those fish if there's uh, this bacteria in the tank than if you're only transferring, say, two at a time. And the same with the wounds. If they found that if there was, if the fish had wounds, um, they had a much higher mortality from this bacteria compared to fish uh, that were not wounded in any way. Um, they looked at exposure dose, higher the dose, higher the mortality. Uh, same with exposure time, the longer the fish were exposed to the bacteria, the higher the mortality rate. Uh, warmer water led to higher mortality, and there was no impact depending on the, how much uh, salt was in the water. Um, major takeaway from this, I would say, is how you handle the fish is very important. Uh, transport is probably the most vulnerable time uh, for a fish that would be living in these systems, um, it's just very stressful, and stress is a major um, 
risk factor for these diseases. A lot of these diseases are opportunistic, so healthy fish, even if the pathogen is present in the system, healthy fish may not get sick. But as soon as they're stressed um, or wounded, uh, they're much more likely to get sick. So just be gentle with the fish. And avoid multiple transfers if you can. So some control methods for, say, uh, you either have a bacteria or any of these pathogens in your system, or you really want to make sure you don't get them in your system. Uh, some options, and I won't go into too much detail, are UV sterilization, um, biocontrol is becoming very popular. This is when you introduce a non-pathogenic bacteria into a system to either promote uh, fish and or plant health, um, or for them to compete with the pathogens. So say the uh, biocontrol bacteria might uptake the same nutrients, or they might grow in the same area that this pathogen would. By introducing this beneficial bacteria, it competes with the pathogen, so then the path pathogen can't like take hold in the system. Um, ozone uh, to sterilize the water is another option. Uh, filtration methods uh, can also remove, it, it's good for solid waste management and can also help remove pathogens. Um, there are numerous chemical additives you can put in a system, some of them being uh, sodium chloride, hydrogen peroxide, there's a bunch of other chemicals. The issue with uh, chemicals is you have to be careful when you're working in aquaponics because something that might be safe for an aquaculture system could harm the plants and vice versa. So you have to be, you have to make sure that A, it's a legal um, chemical because some have been made illegal for various reasons and that it won't, that it's safe for both uh, organisms. Uh, heat is another option and there are vaccines available for the fish um, for certain bacteria and viruses. Something I really want to stress is no antibiotics. Uh, it used to be very common to just dump a bunch of antibiotics into an aquaculture system and to, to, for prevention, uh, please don't do that. Uh, both because antimicrobial resistance is becoming a major problem and plants can uptake antibiotics. So it might be okay for the fish, but then you might not actually be able to sell the plants or you definitely can't sell them as organic. Um, just, just don't do it. It's not good. And then biosecurity measures. Prevention is the best treatment. Um, so you want to establish protocols that can just try to make it a lot harder for a pathogen to even be introduced into the system. Because um, they're very hard to remove. Uh, so just you want to prevent it. So some good practices are try to avoid contact with the water and the fish and the plants as much as you can. Obviously, you're going to have to be hands-on in the system, but try to avoid it as much as possible. And if you have to, wash your hands, possibly wear gloves, um, anything to limit uh, contact between any pathogens you might have on your own hands uh, in the system. Quarantine incoming fish shipments. This is important. If you can, if you have the space um, and the tanks needed, um, have a special tank for new fish. Keep them in the tank for a certain amount of time. If, if they show no disease symptoms, that's great. Then introduce them into your established system. It's, it could save you a lot of money and heartbreak in the long run because if you just transfer these fish directly into your aquaponics system, A, the water from the whatever facility you bought them from is probably just has a lot of pathogens in it just because this is, we're working with animals. Um, and B, the fish could already be infected. Uh, so, so quarantine uh, can be very useful. Um, Properly storing your equipment, keeping netting off the floor, um, 
just tools in their proper locations. You don't want things scattered everywhere, uh, that kind of idea. You don't want them coming in contact, say, with the water on the floor that just could be these great reservoirs for diseases. Um, an option is disinfecting foot baths at entrances and exits, uh, just trying not to track uh, pathogens in on your shoes. Uh, try to buy from certified or known reliable uh, sources for fish and plants. And then maintaining good water quality. Um, poor water quality is a major stressor for fish. Um, and poor water quality can provide awesome environments for uh, pathogen growth. And then those are the two grants. These projects have been funded by and references. Any questions? Yes. Have you found uh, in your research any surfaces that are less prone to biofilm accumulation? Surfaces? Yeah, like materials and stuff? <sighs> no. Biofilm bacteria are incredibly hardy and they will attach to pretty much anything they can. Um, any material you're going to use mm -hmm. in an aquaponic system, bacteria will grow on. Uh, they've, they've tested plastics, all different kinds, uh, glass, what concrete. About stainless steel? Yes. Yes. Um, so unfortunately. <laughs> yes? So given that they are going to grow, um, mm -hmm. is there a part of a periodic cleaning regime Yes. I mean, even uh, with your best practices, you're going to have some growth. Yeah, definitely. There's no way you can avoid some bacterial growth. Most of it will not be pathogenic. Uh, you're going to have a lot of bacteria in your system. Most of it will be fine. Um, but it's recommended that you avoid, because um, some uh, aquaponics growers will Kind of like when you have a pet fish, you'll take all the fish out, you'll sterilize the tank, and then put them back in. But, but like I said earlier, transfers stress them out and cause situations will, where they can uh, wound themselves either by rubbing up against each other or against the sides of the tank. So that's not recommended. Um, that's when uh, disinfection methods come in. Um, so just sterilizing the water, usually between the fish and the plant. Um, tanks to just reduce the overall bacteria presence. Yeah, I think that lends itself to that, the filtration and treatment before water is getting into the plant area. Yeah. As a, an analog to post-harvest equipment and services, a lot of times for both batch and pass-through water, introducing a wash water sanitizer in that context, even if it's not required, um, will reduce the incidence of biofilm accumulation. So I think if you could have a steady state of something that works in that system and doesn't affect the fish, that would probably help. It's not going to eliminate or the risk, or probably reduce the risk of So that's, a, that's actually an advantage to having you know, several places in the system, that that means you have places where you don't have organisms, well not non-microbes, <laughs> mm -hmm. that you can actually treat it. And also, I, I don't want to you know, dominate the thing here, but I was really interested in this idea of having a separate um, place for the nitrifying bacteria. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, so the basic idea is you have this separate tank, um, preferably after any solids management tank you have, um, and you grow the bacteria, the nitrifying bacteria on, you can either do it attached growth where you just have them grow on surface the surfaces, um, of the tank or you can have suspended growth where you'll grow them on say something as simple as bottle caps mm -hmm. or beads um, and they just kind of float in the water and as you pump the water through that tank they'll they convert the ammonia to the nitrate um, for the plants to use uh, that's good if you have a bigger system because that's just a that's a higher volume of fish waste and a higher volume of water, so it might not be enough to have them just in the hydroponic system. Thank you. Do you have any recommendations for identifying uh, these diseases in fish or helping us identify them when they come up? That's been sort of a problem that I've had. Yeah, um, some of, before they can get bad, I'm not sure. Um, some, a lot of them can be pretty obvious, either uh, 
there will be uh, hemorrhaging, uh, where you, you'll notice reddening of the skin or the eyes, um, or you'll see parasites growing on the outside or fungi. Um, internally, uh, if it's not something that presents on the outside uh, as much, you would have to you would have to do direct fish testing. Um, I, if you are having issues, I would recommend just doing that regularly. Um, but what do you mean fish testing? Like like you testing for yeah, particular you, disease. Exactly. Just veterinary. Veterinary. Like, yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, I wonder, like in the field of people who are growing fish and selling them very quickly. I mean, I'm like how realistic is that for practitioners? Because in many cases, I would think that if you notice a disease is bad enough, you just pull the fish out yeah. and remove it. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, you're we're counting hours and time of labor and like the time to pull out a fish and isolate in a salt yeah. bath and treat it. Mm -hmm. I'm just worried that maybe the there's a, not as much value in it long term versus just, you know, Honestly. producing a product. Honestly, there isn't. Usually it's just you keep an eye on the fish if they seem lethargic, if they're bumping into things, yeah. um, if they're not eating, if they're not growing as much as they should, they're probably sick. Um, but yeah, there's really not a ton of value in testing them um, unless they have apparent signs of illness. And if they do, just pull them out. Uh, that's about as much as you can effectively do, um, unfortunately. So, so fish testing and monitoring isn't a typical SOP in like a large scale aquaponic operation. That's um, it. Might be more common the larger the system is, but uh, a lot of times, it, depending on when, what stage of fish they start with, uh, the turnover might be high enough that they don't bother, or again, it might not be economically feasible. Um, because sometimes you can still, if they're not if they're not human pathogens, you can still sell the fish if they have a sickness like that. Um, it's just it hurts your market value when it's too small, like when the when the disease affects the fish so that it doesn't grow as much. So it's just you don't make as much money because it's a smaller fish. Right. And just just kind of add to all that. Um, I used to work in the ornamental aquarium industry, and so we would be dealing often with. Uh, a marine fish that would easily be worth $100 a piece or more, and even then it was generally not economically feasible to bother treating a fish. And you, you'd end up spending more on medication than the fish is actually worth. And so when we start talking about food fish where, you know, it's almost pennies a pound sometimes, uh, it's, yeah, you just, you just call them and, and move on, basically. Yeah, your best bet is prevention and then disinfection. If you you can. Treatment is not usually feasible or worthwhile. Just, uh, I'm no expert in the but I think it could be an idea where you can separate fish into just several tanks. It's probably not very likely that you have fish sick at the same time in all tanks. So you can shut down one tank if you see something and deal with it. Just that tank. Probably it would just relieve the loss a little bit. Yeah, often they'll have multiple fish tanks, and that's probably, if you can, that's a better idea than having like one massive tank, because you're right, you see symptoms, especially if something highly contagious, shut that one down. Do you have any general rules of thought for how we know whether something is contagious? Um, that would be when you, you, when you would consult a veterinarian. Um, they, would, they would know more about the particular disease. A lot of these are highly contagious. That's why they're common and just more prevalent in the literature because people are concerned about them. Um, but yeah, that's when you would talk to a talk to a vet. Um, I have a quick, I have a fish plague story. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the one time I've had an issue with disease is actually I, I made a comment about this earlier is um, temperature stress causes uh, the fish significant problems. And uh, my heater broke overnight, and it was winter, of course, and the tank got down to 60, 55, and their tilapia, they like it 75. So the next day, I could get the temperature back up, but then I noticed the signs of septicemia coming along in the bulge eye, and I just spent a day there triaging every single fish I saw, 
And eventually I must have put out the flame because there was you know, more sickness after some period of time. So, um, and that was in a separate quarantine tank anyway, not in the main system. That's good. Which, yeah, you know, it's if it's if I think if you see it in the main system, try to block off the tank as quickly as you can. Um, and sometimes, depending on the pathogen, you might just have to depopulate the fish in the plant, sterilize the whole system, and start again. Um, if if it's a pathogen that tends to stick around um, and you just keep having fish get sick, uh, that might be your best bet. But. Is it visible to grow more than one kind of fish in the same tank? And does that reduce the, the, the risk to spread the diseases? Possibly. Um, a lot of these pathogens overlap. Um, like herpes viruses affect tons of species. Um, you, that would be a case where you'd want to make sure, A, that the fish wouldn't fight, because mm -hmm. that can be an issue if the, <laughs> if the species are not compatible, um, make sure there's like both cold water, both warm water <laughs> fish. Um, I do know, I have read articles where they co-culture like catfish and trout, uh, and it, it does work. Um, but the problem is a lot of these pathogens uh, overlap species. Um, so, yeah. Did you do or do you know of studies uh, trying to correlate uh, these pathogen levels with uh, just the overall water quality and the density that people are growing in their systems? I'm, I'm a big believer that aquaponics people try to overdrive the, the aquaculture side of the operation. And yeah. I, I, my personal undocumented experience is that as you drive your population up, you're just creating, you know, a feedlot for fish, and it's unhealthy, and they get sick. Yes, you know? definitely. Um, I have several numbers floating around my head in terms of stocking densities, mm -hmm. maximum stocking densities, and I can't yeah. remember any of them. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, definitely the higher the stocking density, the more... More likely. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Because uh, A, it provides a... There's a lot more waste, and that's just a great environment for pathogens to grow, because there's just so much food. Um, and fish are more stressed, they're, there's less room, um, and so they they end up wounded, either just... The even organic particulates in the water should be the source for the bacteria when they're living in film. Mm -hmm. So if you lower that, exactly, not exactly. so much deep, not so much bacteria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, proper water quality and environmental factors like temperature is very important, um, and stocking density are, if, if, you get, if you get that down, you you can have a pathogen or disease-free system. This list here, for fish that still occur in, you know, with the quotes around it now, but natural environment, so mm -hmm. you're getting close to where we don't have natural environment anymore. <laughs> but where, where you're still in healthy environments and there's fish that are living in the wild, do you see these pathogens in, in pristine conditions? Not nearly They just don't much. really occur. Really? Not nearly yeah. as much because uh, what what it comes down to yeah, is in their density. Yeah. It's just like you're going to see a lot faster spread with, of the common cold in a city. Right. Um, same idea. It's my belief. It comes down to the mm -hmm. quality of the environment you're creating for the animals. It really right. does. If you treat your system well and you know you maintain the proper water quality parameters, uh, and you can you can just Google them. Uh, the United Nations actually has a fantastic part of their website, believe it or not, if you're interested in setting up an aquaponic system. Yeah. Um, so, it, yeah, if you work hard to maintain a healthy system um, and treat the fish and plants well, you're most likely going to be fine, as long as you're careful about where, who your supplier is. It's, it's honestly not as scary as I'm making it sound. It's really easy to have a disease-free system. That's just not as fun for me. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.